Zach, I just want to say welcome to the show. It is an honor uh, to have you on. We have known each other for maybe close to a decade at this point. On, it's, I think. it's been a while. You, you and I connected very early on in my, what was then the zero to launch journey it is now, of course, the earnable journey for anybody that's familiar with uh, Ramit Sethi's I Will Teach You to Be Rich World. And you and I met very, very early on and were one of my early accelerator business coaches. Then we met in person and you've been uh, been a pretty big instrumental part of the the journey of making my transition into the coaching and entrepreneur world. So yes, we've we've known each other for a while and we definitely go a ways back. That we do. And the cool thing that I think people ought to know about you if they have no idea uh, who you are is just one of the things that I've always respected about you is how congruent your life is. You live a values-based life, you know, from family, you know, being a dad, you know, as being a husband to American Ninja Warrior to, you know, editing Cobra Kai, you know, and then like building Optimize Yourself. Uh, and you really do live what you teach uh, in Optimize Yourself. And I almost want to go back in time to the story of burnout, you know, that taught you, you know, everything. Well, was the turning point uh, that got you down this path? Could you tell us more about that? Yeah. So the first thing to clarify is which story of burnout. Um, <laughs> if we're going to be totally honest, there are many. So I'm like, hmm, which one do I start with? Um, I think the one that's probably most relevant to this audience, given that it was the the catalyst for making the transition from my world as an editor and director and producer in Hollywood to now coaching and teaching the things that I do, uh, it would be what I call the FaceTime story. So this is back in 2015, so give or take eight or nine years ago now. Um, I was at what appeared to be the height of my career. I had worked my butt off for years and years and years in Hollywood. Literally came from a small dairy farming community in northern Wisconsin, had zero connections, had no industry experience, drove across, across the country to Los Angeles, started my career right uh, after college and climbed from the bottom. And here I was at the, what I thought was the top of the ladder. I was editing season one of the television show Empire. And for anybody that doesn't remember that show, when it came out in 2015, it was a cultural phenomenon. Was. It was on the cover of every single magazine, newspaper, website. It was breaking decades worth of ratings records, and it was a huge cultural zeitgeist. It's probably one of the last times, uh, now that we're in this fragmented streaming area, where there was appointment television. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember there were, uh, there were like meetup groups where people would show up in the hundreds at bars when the show aired live just so they could watch a TV show together. It was the weirdest thing. I actually went to a few of them. Right. It was such a weird experience. Yeah. So the point is that I was, I don't remember exactly the timeline, but give or take, I was a few weeks away from the season one finale airing, knowing that it was going to be aired in front of 20 to 25 million people. Like that was just a foregone conclusion. Here I am sitting in my, you know, little dark windowless room, editing away at my computer and my keyboard thinking I've quote unquote made it. 25 million people are going to see what I'm doing right now. The flip side of that was I was also putting my children to bed via FaceTime every single night. And I had been doing it for months on end. I was commuting about three hours a day. I didn't see my family awake Monday through Friday. So that cl climbing that success ladder was costing me a lot. And there was one very specific incident that tied all of it together. That was the catalyst for what got me here today. I was putting both of my kids to bed via FaceTime like I did every single night. Uh, my wife thought she hung up the phone, and she hadn't. And my son, who was give or take about five at the time, said, why doesn't daddy want to put us to bed at night? Why doesn't he love us? And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Here I was sitting there, all excited about having reached the height of my career, and I was at rock bottom. And I said, something has got to change. And I realized that at a very early age, I'd hit what felt like a glass ceiling in my career. And I thought, this is it for the next 30 years. Sure, I am working on high profile shows, but this is the cost. There's got to be a better way. And then I had a massive identity crisis realizing that film and television editing and producing and directing, that's not what I did. That's who I was. And if that's not who I wanted to be anymore, who was I as a person and how was I going to support my family? That's when I started down the rabbit hole of figuring out how can I monetize my skills, my abilities, my experiences, and provide value to others so I never have to say yes to projects or people that are going to destroy my soul in the process? So that was one of the many burnout stories, but that's really the most pertinent one to today's conversation. 
where does that fit into the COVID timeline? Like how many years before? Oh, this pandemic? was years before. This was at least five years before COVID hit. Um, this was, I, I had just started a podcast at the time. It was called Fitness and Post before I'd really rebranded and learned how to properly position myself. So Fitness and Post was the worst branding ever. And here's why. <laughs> it was specifically fitness for people that worked in post-production. So people yep. in post-production knew what post meant, and they all said, I'm terrified of fitness. Fitness isn't my thing. And everybody that was interested in fitness via SEO or a podcast search would say, I love fitness, but what's post? Is this like after exercise, like post-exercise routines? I'm like, oh my God, this branding is a nightmare. But at that, at that point, I wasn't doing it to monetize. I never even thought there was money in it. I just needed an outlet to share my passion for blending health and exercise and the athlete's mindset and movement with creativity because nobody was talking about the value of the intersection of creativity and athleticism. And that's an area, this uh, unique intersection where I've been obsessed for most of my career. And it started because a lot of other podcasters in the Hollywood space wanted me to talk about my career as an editor and the craft as an editor. And they'd always ask me, what else do you want to talk about? Oh, I'd love to talk about my standing desks and all these routines and this and that. And they're like, no, we just want you to talk about burn notice. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I ended up starting my own podcast. But once I kind of had this kind of, um, you know, this rock bottom moment, I thought, I've got value here. I know there's something with this podcast. I have no idea what to do with it. I don't know how to build a community around it. I don't know how to monetize it. And that was initially when I started to listen to some of the top podcasts of people like Pat Flynn and Tim Ferriss mm -hmm. and these other names uh, in the entrepreneur space, of which there were much fewer about 10 yeah. years ago. Um, and I happened to listen to a multitude of them in the same week, all with Ramit Sethi. And I'm like, I like this guy because he's honest, he's no BS, and he shares what it's really like to do this, but he seems really smart. And that's when I discovered Zero to Launch shortly after, joined the Accelerator coaching program. Boom, met you and the rest is history and we're doing a podcast today. That we are and that we are. There's even more to, I mean, there's so much to your story because uh, just as you brought us up from the past to the present, I mean, one of the things I saw like on your Facebook, you know, semi-recently was just, you know, it's like, oh, shoot, he's he's hanging out there with like Tony Horton. Like I, 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 I've watched so many Tony, Tony Horton videos in P90X, P90X2, mm -hmm. P90, you know, like uh, just, just, and so what was it like meeting, I guess, uh, someone that you looked up to in the fitness world? Because it, it was very clear to me when I saw that post that, you know, fitness has never stopped being a passion for you. Yeah, no, fitness is not only a passion for me, but it's the fuel that keeps me going with my creativity, with my business building, with my family. That's the ingredient that when I remove it, everything falls apart. So for me, fitness is absolutely essential. And when I was trying to blend fitness and athleticism with my job as an editor much earlier in my career, it was virtually impossible. One of the reasons that I have this recurring history of burnout, because it was always, I'm going to work really hard. I've got tunnel vision. I'm super focused. I'm going to get healthy, quote unquote, at the next hiatus, right? But then the next hiatus never comes which is very similar for entrepreneurs. I find myself in the same cycle. I'll get healthy after I'm done with the next launch or the, I'm done building the next product. That time never comes. So you have to build in the habits to integrate all of them. And it was about five years ago after one another completely different story of burnout that I hit um, that was during this process of trying to learn how to balance being an editor, having a family, being an entrepreneur. Um, and it was another one of those low of the lows where I had gained a significant amount of weight and I had been burned out for a few months. And I found myself uh, binge watching American Ninja Warrior with my kids because mm -hmm. they loved American Ninja Warrior. So here I am watching American Ninja Warrior, sitting on the couch, overweight, with a giant bowl of popcorn on my belly. <laughs> and inside the popcorn was a bunch of Oreos. Now just picture this vision and me looking at the TV, watching American Ninja Warrior saying, I could do that. Nice. I, can't, I can't do it yet, but I could do that. And that was the catalyst for me really digging in at a much le deeper level to not just incorporate fitness into my life, but turn fitness into a skill and turn it into a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer with goal setting that if you really want to go after just a goal and the result, but you forget about the process, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. So I technically have set a goal that almost six years later, 100% failure. But when I look at all of the benefits that have come from the frost, from the process, whether it's the friends that I've made, the connections that I've made, the experiences that I've had, the skills that I've acquired, 
like the baseline level of fitness and skills and abilities that I have compared to five years ago, like it's night and day. But technically, I'm a failure as an American Ninja Warrior. So when you set a goal, I always want to set a goal that makes me uncomfortable, that inspires me, knowing that the process is what's going to change the course of my life, all of which brought me to I had been doing P90X for years and years just to kind of stay in shape and stay healthy. And I had Tony Horton on my podcast. And when I started doing the ninja training, I had reconnected with him for another podcast. And through a circuitous series of events that aren't relevant to this call, his wife emailed me one Sunday and said, Tony does ninja training every Sunday. Why don't you come on by with your friend who was also oh, a, a ninja warrior? And I was like, oh my God, Tony Horton <laughs> invited me to his house, right? And I've never yeah. been more terrified in my life. And I had no idea what I was getting into because P90X is intense, but it's yes. for like 60 minutes. His Sunday ninja workouts are four hours. Oh my God. Four hours of pushing and pulling and swinging and all this crazy stuff that I'd never done before. <laughs> and after the first time I did it, I got in my car and I had to lift my arms up to the steering wheel so I could leave. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, I have found my people. I have found my tribe. And almost every Sunday for the last five years has been Sunday Ninja Fun Day with Tony Horton. So it's just that it's become a part of my life. Yeah, that is such an amazing story. I love that. And it's something that I always noticed just being such this um, a pillar of your brand back when, you know, you branded it as fitness and post and then when you, you know, then updated to optimize yourself, which I think is a really cool transition that would be really helpful for folks who are listening in. How and why did you make that transition? Yeah, there, there are a few different reasons. Uh, the first of which I had already shared is it's just the branding and the name was confusing to everybody. So fitness was scary for post-production people. People in fitness had no idea what post was. So there, there was no real like niche segment where I was really serving anybody. If you want to find a harder niche to monetize than film and television editors who are interested in health and fitness, it's the smallest niche on the planet. And I know because I've saturated it, right? So beyond that, the other thing that was happening is shortly into my podcasting journey, even before I wanted to monetize things, I realized there are more things that I want to talk about that are not just fitness. I wanted to talk about careers. I wanted to talk about relationships. I wanted to talk about productivity and time management and all of these things that I was learning to develop a better sense of work-life balance and work towards my goals. And as I started to diversify, people would say, what does this have to do with fitness? I'm confused. I'm like, I've got a branding problem. Mm -hmm. So I know I've, you've told me this. Other business coaches have told me this. They say, you have to be specific, right? If you're the six pack abs guy, I want to go to your site and you get me six pack abs and here's the free lead magnet to get your six pack abs, which leads to the low ticket offer to get your six pack abs, which leads to the coaching program to get your six pack abs, right? Yeah. That's not me. I am all over the place. I like to talk about everything. I have an affinity to Tim Ferriss because mm. he's so scattershot and all over the place. And look at what he's done with that. He's like, yeah. I want to talk about mushrooms one week. Then I want to talk about networking. Then I want to talk about venture capital. It's like Tim is all over the place and I love it because he's just, that's authentically who he is. He has a lot of different diverse interests and that was me. And I wanted to capitalize on a brand that allowed me to pretty much do whatever I wanted where I could zoom in. So I have these kind of these learning paths or these branches of optimize yourself, which are focus yourself, advance yourself, move yourself, balance yourself so you can zoom in. But I never wanted to have to ask for permission to talk about something that wasn't within my brand. So I created the broadest idea possible, which is using this word that people specifically in creative, but also technical industries use all the time. It's all about optimization. Mm -hmm. And it drove me crazy when my colleagues would say, we're optimizing our hard drive speeds or optimizing our internet connections or optimizing our throughputs. I'm like, the most important creative tool you have is this one. Why is nobody optimizing this? People thought it was crazy at the time. Clearly now it's caught on. But I thought, what if we started to focus on optimizing ourselves? Ooh, that's better than fitness and post. Maybe I can stick with that. Nice. So the challenge that comes with that, as you know, because you've helped with business coaching, is that when you're that broad, it's hard to capture very specific markets and position yourself because people come to your site and you're like, what is this about? It's very broad. So even to this day, I'm still learning positioning and just how, how to create a message that's specific enough while also being broad enough. Because I'm, mm. I'm unapologetically going to talk about whatever I want, whenever I want, but I also want to make sure that I'm curating the value that I'm creating through the different various forms of content, whether free or paid. So when somebody has a problem, they can find their solution quickly. 
But that was the impetus for the rebrand. That is such an instructional story. And you haven't done it wrong uh, because, you know, there's, there's a saying. It's like the riches are in the niches. But uh, as you know, it's possible to actually be too much, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, if the market is too small, uh, then it could be really difficult uh, to build a sustainable business over a long period of time. And so, like, there's a couple different ways to niche. Like, one of them is, you know, just by the audience. And then you can actually provide a broad set of solutions to a narrowly focused audience. On the flip side, you could then just, you know, do the inverse of that. You have, you know, super large audience, but then you have a very, very specific solution. And you actually see that quite a bit in the online course industry. And you're just like, oh, anybody can create an online course, but just an online course. You know, there are other ways to niche down as well. You know, and there's also the concept of niche expansion, you know, because mm-hmm. every single business uh, as they evolve, you know, if you even just look at the uh, technology uh, adoption uh, curve, you know, it's broken up into five parts. It's it's innovators. Uh, then you've got the, um, I'm forgetting it, the er, first, is it the early adopters? Then the, ah, yes, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. Those are the five. And as you you can as you expand out the niche, like the audience just naturally becomes broader. And that's one of the things that I want to talk to you about a little bit later in this conversation. But first, the pandemic. So you have this thriving coaching business, and then the world shuts down. Because you're, you're, at the time, you were niched down to helping people in Hollywood. Of course, the world shut down. So, like, tell us that story. What happened? Well, first, I'm probably, I'm going to clarify. I'm not sure I had a thriving coaching business. I had a coaching business, and I was slowly building it, but it, I wasn't making a living coaching. I was making fairly decent money as a side hustle, as a supplement to me being a full-time uh, film and television editor. Got it. Um, but I was far from this is a thriving business and I had a team and I was bringing in all this money and I wasn't at that point. Yeah, but I was starting to see it. Um, and just to, to kind of answer this and also dovetail the, the tail end of our previous conversation, um, the mindset from which I've looked at this entire process of coaching and working with this very niche group of people, I've, and I've said it this way to many people, this is the back of the napkin, back of the napkin version of me being in learning mode. I have one niche where I'm learning how to solve very broad problem, right? So I've been zoomed into this one specific group of people for the last seven or eight years, realizing that the challenges and struggles and obstacles are much, much broader. So as you talked about later in the conversation, what I'm learning how to do next is take the value that I bring to this audience and move it to much larger and bro- larger and broader audiences that have the same problems. Yes. But that brings me to, it's actually right before the pandemic, and this has a, a, a lot to do with the work that I did with you as well, even pre-pandemic. Um, but because of what I was learning about selling online courses, I was getting pretty good at selling online courses. But then what I discovered, and the reason that I transitioned to coaching, as you know, and you probably even talked about, the completion rate of self-guided online courses, like the industry should be embarrassed. It's like, come on, like the number of people that actually get through and complete these courses and move on and get like legitimate results is so low. And I didn't want to build a business model where I was making money and creating funnels and people were getting results. And I decided I want to build a business that gets people real results. So that's when I decided to switch from, I create self-guided online courses to I'm going to coach people. And the self-guided online courses is the curriculum or just the supplement to it. So I had been doing private coaching And I decided it was time to expand into small groups. And I was experimenting with the idea of expanding even beyond that. But the business model for me in March, early March of 2020, was that I was going to spend the entire year teaching creative introverts how to network and build relationships in person. That was my business model, right? Mm -hmm. And then March 11th of 2020 happened. And everything on my calendar the rest of the year, select all, delete had a blank slate. I sat on the couch right behind me for a week and I stared at the wall and I said, I'm scared. Like okay. nobody's going to pay money for coaching and to learn networking and all these other things that I teach. Like this is never going to happen. And I believe one of the next calls I had was with you. And you're like, 
I think there might be an opportunity here. And this is when I learned, number one, how to become a survey ninja, which I still use to this day, the ability to really know the psychology of surveys, how to ask the right questions, how to provide value. And we discovered that the best way for me to provide value to my existing list and audience, which by the way, very small, very niche, even to this day, it's still a very small list. Um, But being able to expand it to a larger group coaching program was the next thing that we looked into doing. And direct, I mean, we're talking direct results. This is not one of those like bloated testimonials because of the direct calls that you and I had during the pandemic, doubled the size of my business in nine months. And that model is still the model that I operate to this day, which is a combination of large group office hour style coaching with self-guided curriculum. I do small group live cohort classes and I still do private coaching. And if somebody wants to buy a course online and click a link and pay me money, that's fine, but it's not really a core part of my model. But now what I'm seeing is that I'm getting tremendous results because of the amount of interaction that I have with my students, mm-hmm. but the level, uh, the level that my community is interacting with each other and helping each other, I now have people that have been sticking around for years. So the retention rate is high and the churn rate is really, really low. And a lot of that is directly related to the work that you and I did in 2020. Thank you. And uh, it is beautiful to know that it has stood the test of time. And the fact that you're now thinking about, huh, how do I help more people uh, is exciting to me because I know everything that you have done, because I've seen you do it, has already been tested. Like I know that it helps people's lives for years to come. So let's talk about that. I mean, obviously at the time of this recording, there's, you know, this, this writer strike that's been going on for how long? Uh, it started, I believe, at the end of March. The writers technically are now done striking and they're now back to work as of this week. But the business is still, for the most part, shut down because sag after the actors union is still on strike. And at least as of the recording of this conversation, they're still deep into negotiations. So the the short version of it for people that aren't directly in the industry, the studio system, they knew this was coming. So the work slowdown actually started in November of last year. So most of my students and most of the industry started becoming unemployed as early as November of last year. So there's a good subset of the population of my industry that's been unemployed for almost a year straight. So basically, my entire list went from I am excited to learn more about time management and learn more about how to build relationships to land my dream job to keep sending me free stuff. I'm unemployed and I'm broke. (laughs) Out of, has anyone uh, within your audience uh, successfully transitioned out of Hollywood to anything else? Uh, To be honest, that's not really the goal that I find. The the most common transitions that I see are inside the industry from one role to another or from one skill set or sector of the industry to another. What I have is a lot of people that are in different industries that want to get into entertainment. But what I find specifically about people that are creatives, especially those that are storytellers and those are the people that I work with, is that it's not so much about get me out of this industry and help me find other work. It's help me find the passion or regain the passion for the work that I used to love that's now stealing my soul. So very few people have actually said, I want to escape the industry. They think that's what they want. Then I start to work with them and they're like, I actually, I want to keep doing what I'm doing. Just show me how to do it without it destroying my entire life. Hmm. So, but I've got quite a few people that come from totally different industries that some, through some random podcast search, they find me. They're like, you're the one that's going to help me break into the industry. But almost nobody in my community actually wants to get out of entertainment. They just Hmm. want to, what they want to learn how to do it and be passionate about the stories that they tell, be more fulfilled by their work and do it more sustainably. Sustainability is a big, big word that I talk about a lot. Like anybody can sprint, but try sprinting a double ultra marathon, which is what working in the entertainment industry is. You have to learn completely different practices. So very few people actually want to escape the industry altogether. That's really helpful context for me to have. And I've got so many bubbling uh, questions uh, because I know that you and I wanted to talk about, you know, just like what does the evolution you know, of optimize yourself look like moving forward. Do you already have any ideas? Uh, I've got a lot of ideas. Yes. There are a lot of unknowns, a lot of things that I don't know that I don't know in a lot of areas that I've struggled. And I think I'll, it's not necessarily going backwards, but I want to give some further context. 
Okay. Is that since I started building both the original podcast, then rebranding, building all these coaching materials, building the online course materials, I love creating products. I love coaching and I love teaching. I'm that creative entrepreneur that loves the product side, which means that I hate the lead generation and the marketing side. And I have basically let it happen organically on its own. Whoever comes and finds me, great. And that's worked really well so far. I've really learned how to serve the people that find me, but I've now hit a wall where I can't grow anymore because I've saturated this organic, they just happen to find me market. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten really good at serving people once they get on the email list. Getting them on my email list and ha making it happen consistently is the bane of my existence. So if this is a conversation about, let's have Zach teach us about lead generation, I'm the last person you should have on as an expert. If it's how do I serve people once they join the list and how do I solve their problems and understand their needs, that's what I've become really good at. Mm -hmm. So what I didn't have seven or eight years ago was any level of expertise that wasn't film and television editing and storytelling. But now I have an extremely high level of confidence that working with creative minds, working with artists, working with storytellers, I really understand their problems on a much more intimate level and I feel confident I can solve them. My challenge is, how do I find those other audiences and expand beyond this little niche? And more importantly, how do I do it consistently? Because I've really yeah. completely ignored learning the skill of lead generation. And this, yeah. is, this is a huge, fatal, fundamental flaw that if I had a time machine, I'd go back to myself three years ago and I'd be like, dude, pay attention to lead generation. I just didn't want to. And now I'm paying for it. I'm literally paying for it right now. Hmm. Well, you know, there's really... Just a lot of over uh, over complication uh, when it comes to you know uh, lead generation audience mm -hmm. growth, but if we just had to distill it down, there's one to one. There's one to many. Warm, cold. Within those buckets, we can then break it down into smaller buckets, right? And it's like you've got paid advertising, you've got you know podcasting, or you know, but like everything that's warm. You know, it's conversations like this, you know, it's, it's TV, it's, uh, there's all these different channels, but it's warm, right? Somebody's going to know you, you're not paying to get in front of somebody's face. It's not interruptive, you know, uh, or even like, so, you know, search intent uh, based, uh, like, you know, Google uh, PPC, but all that's to say is the way to go about it is to double down on what your strengths are, which for you, I know personally relationships, like Leveraging and leveraging isn't even like the right word, you know. Um, creating win win partnerships with people who are in your network or you know, second degree, third degree connections, uh, who have access to the people who you are uniquely equipped to be able to help is a value add to them and a value add to you. And there are multiple, uh, there's B2C and B2B, you know, uh, on the B2B side of things. I know we had spoken about this uh, in another call, but, you know, just immediately, as soon as uh, one of our mutual friends uh, re uh, reintroduced us, I was like, yeah, Zach would crush in B2B because you have all of these processes you're able to speak the language you've been in the industry and you have a unique perspective you have all of these decades of expertise and people love process and they love results even more and you know how to do both and so like just just it just it's and so then from there it's like oh the affinity you know who who are you uniquely uh uh jay abraham has this great way of thinking about this even right now who do your people spend money on before they come to you? And who do they spend money with after you? Now, here's the funny thing. I've actually asked similar questions, largely thanks to you and survey methodology. Mm -hmm. They don't spend money on anybody before me. Uh -huh. the, the audience that I'm working with now, they're devoid of any personal or professional development knowledge or background. By and large, almost every single person, I'm the first one that they work with. So what essentially what one of the things that I've discovered is that I didn't enter a market. I created a market. There wow. wasn't personal and professional development for creatives in post-production in Hollywood. Yeah. I'm it. Since then, a couple of people have uh, copied my model and they're, they're doing it uh, to a lower or lesser extent. But I essentially created a market where there wasn't one. So it's mm -hmm. been really difficult for me to use some of the me methodologies where I've asked these questions like, 
who are the influencers that you learn this from or that from? And in the business space or the entrepreneur space, everybody's going to give you the same five or 10 names. And it's pretty obvious, right? Like if you were to ask it in the entrepreneur space or the podcast space, who's one of the influencers that help you get started? Pat Flynn, mm. done. Like obvious. Everybody knows that name, right? There aren't names like that. There aren't thought leaders. There aren't um, you know, leaders, leaders or influencers in the personal development space in entertainment. And I've looked for years. So this is one of my problems is I don't know what other audiences to go to, which is one of the yeah. reasons that I think the pivot that I'm really interested in making is it's not abandoning my current audience, but I've been thinking too small, which is I have to stay within Hollywood storytelling and Hollywood entertainment. And I was thinking I'm going to branch out from editors to writers and composers and or actors. And then I realized they don't have a whole lot of thought leadership or it, like existing audiences either. So what if I just branch out to creatives that have the same challenges in any industry? Now I'm in a wide open ocean and I'm swimming and I'm like, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. So that's kind of where I am right now. I love that. Uh, this is going to be fun. All right. So here's another magic question for you. Who's currently spending money to reach your existing audience? I don't, I'm not sure anybody would be, to be honest. If they are, I'm not, I'm not aware of it enough. There are, there are certainly other influencers or entrepreneurs in my niche where we have like affiliate marketing partnerships and they might be spending a little to get in front of my group. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure anybody is. And if they are, I'm unaware of them. This this is one of those, we're getting into the area of things that I don't know that I don't know. All right, awesome. I got you. So the beautiful thing is a lot of this is quantified. So now you have been excellent at organic. This is where research tools in paid advertising become really helpful. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, right, if... First tool that I'll mention, uh, do you know Rand Fishkin? I know of, of the name, yes. All right. So, you know, founder of SEO Moz turned Moz, um, data guy. Uh, his more recent venture is SparkToro. Are you familiar? I've heard of it. I don't use it, or but I, I've at least heard the name, yes. Audience research on steroids, social graphing, that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. you can plug in, like, your audience. Describe them. And what it's going to do is it's going to broaden out and show you podcasts. It's going to show you all these different social channels and everything like that. Where do they eat newsletters? It, it, it's going to broaden mm -hmm. the range of like where to be able to find your people. Um, but that's just one tool. And that's going to, that is now something that I would stack uh, with uh, tools like, I think it's SpyFu. There's a whole suite of tools out there that allow you to basically see who's spending on what ads and to whom. Mm -hmm. Those paid audience research tools exist. And then that one, SparkToro gives you the qualitative. Where are all the channels and all the peoples and all the things? And then with these quantified tools, now it's like, okay, how much money is being spent to get to these people? Mm -hmm. Now you found the money. Who's spending the money? Those organizations or organizations tangential to them are potential B2B markets. Mm -hmm. So now you can come to them and be like, hey, all those people you're spending money to go reach? Well, guess what? I know them all. That was my podcast. Mm -hmm. I should come in and give a talk to your people. Let me talk to you so that you could better understand these people. Right. Then these millions of dollars that you're spending in advertising, they won't go down the drain because you'll know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Just like that, consulting. Mm -hmm. That's just on the audience, like research and demo, just to give them insights. And then there's all sorts of things. Once you understand more of what problems they're facing, then, huh, well, turns out, I've been marketing to them for close to a decade now. Kind of know how to do it. <laughs> Want some help with that? <laughs> and, and the beautiful thing is that at that level, uh, they don't need implementation. They have the implementation team. 
at that level of scale, what they are lacking, as revealed through the wasted ad spend, is strategy. Mm -hmm. And so that allows you to be able to set up these kinds of contracts where you truly are delivering value and you and it's going to be able to be measurable. And you're able to do it in a short space of time. This mm -hmm. is a little bit of the Jay Abraham model. It's like, that's why he's able to have the kind of impact that he does because he's working with people who have the implementation teams and already have strategies, strategies in place. And then it's just like, oh, nope, you need to shift that to the, to the left four degrees. Boom. Now we just unlocked all this different kind of revenue, all because you have unique perspective, unique expertise, all of this insight. Uh, to be able to guide them to where it is that they're trying to go. And that's one of the things that I really, really appreciated about just learning and understanding marketing where it's like, yeah, if you know how to get a 5% conversion rate, 2% conversion rate, or whatever the case is, the output of money on the back end changes if you just have more people come through at that conversion rate. And so if... While you're in the process of building up your audiences, you could be consulting with these people who already have those audiences or want help reaching those audiences to be able to bring in just like multi five, six figure contracts, seven figure contract, whatever it is, uh, mm -hmm. to be able to then plug in some nice uh, uh, potential revenue gaps and then reinvest that money in building and reaching the broader audiences, because once you broaden the audience, then the conversion rates are going to dip, probably need a little bit more resources and a little bit of time and stuff to do it. Maybe some positioning changes that need to happen. Uh, but it's just such a beautiful uh, pathway. Uh, mm -hmm. And you would be adding value at every single step of the way. You wouldn't have to do away with your existing audience. You can continue to support them, continue to, you know, help them. Uh, and the more that you grow is the more that you're able to help them grow as well mm -hmm. because some of them if you figure that piece out that they're going to be able to be like oh well whenever the hollywood gets shaky i've got these transferable skills that can generate revenue in different markets that are valued and cherished and it won't be you know overworked or burnt out for using them and i could probably create a full-time income with part-time work and I can work on the thing that I love. And now that I have the kind of resources and revenue to be able to say no to work that's not fair to me, I start to enjoy the work more. Those are some of the first thoughts. I love all of that. And none of it is to question the strategy, but I'm going to throw a wrench in the works. Yeah. All right. Let's as, as soon as you said the word consulting... My immediate reaction was, oh, God, consulting in the corporate space, that sounds miserable. Not because there's anything wrong with it, because that's not what I'm interested in. So I, you can give me some clarification, but let me sure. give you the flip side of it, which is that similar to what I talked about with the Ninja Warrior story. I'm now at the point where I am so firmly convinced that I have found what I believe to my creative to be my creative calling, basically stealing blatantly from Chase Jarvis, who I know is kind of within our concentric circles. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have him on my podcast. And he loved our podcast interview so much, he threw it in his own feet. He's like, dude, can I use this oh, on my show? Nice. Um, awesome. So, yes. But he's he his work and the work of a few others uh, have really helped me identify what I'm truly good at, what's my unique specialty and my unique expertise. Mm -hmm. And what gets me out of bed in the morning is not a six-figure or seven-figure consulting contract. What I love doing is writing, coaching, and teaching. Mm -hmm. So I love doing an office, hour, an office hour session, helping my students rewrite an outreach email or figure out how to better organize their calendar or debate, is this my dream job or is this my dream job? Or how do I set boundaries with, like, I love having those conversations. They literally get me out of bed. Now, I wouldn't discount consulting as this is a great way to generate increased revenue to scale the business. But as far as how I use my time during the day doesn't interest me. What I've also discovered is that even though I would say that it's fairly accurate that I have the 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 term or the identity entrepreneur. I don't identify as an entrepreneur. Yeah. I am a creative and a teacher that by by just because I have to be, I am also an entrepreneur. But I don't enjoy like the I know that a lot of entrepreneurs, I've heard them talk about where I don't care what the product is. I just like figuring out the product market fit and figuring out the funnels and the numbers. That's great. I've nothing against it. That's not me. I'm the creator side of entrepreneurship. 
So I want to wake up knowing that what I'm doing in my time blocks during the day is super exciting. And at least off the top of my head, there's no excitement coming to mind about consulting B2B, mm-hmm. which again has nothing to do with your strategy. That, I just yeah, don't yeah. think it works for for me. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get in front of the right people so I can bring them into my community. Yeah. So let me let me t- talk to you a little bit more. We, we didn't really get too deep into this conversation. Um, and maybe I'm going to get on a soapbox and it's totally irrelevant, but maybe it'll be relevant. Um, yeah. I have I have a lot of feelings about what I believe the future of online education should be. I think that from the advent of the internet to about where we are now, it's all been about collecting and sharing information. Because for all of human existence until now, access to information was the difference, right? If I have access to more information than you, then I can get further along than you. I can get further ahead. I've got a cheat code. Everybody has access to all the information. Information isn't the solution. Information is the problem. There's way too much of it. We don't know how to sift through it. We don't even know where to start, right? So I believe the future of online education is not the access to the information, it's the curation of it. So if I go to like a master class or LinkedIn learning or whatever, you sign up for one low price, you get access to 2,500 courses. I don't want 25 course, 2,500 courses, I want five. I want the five that I need to overcome my challenges and achieve the goals that I want to achieve. And not only do I want five courses, I want you to tell me what order I need to do them in based on where I am in my path. So for me, what I get out of bed, what gets me out of bed, it gets me excited is talking about providing these resources and getting these results for people. And if I can write a book or if I can do a speech in front of these, the, these other businesses and other industries, and it helps the business, but it ultimately brings those people into this community. I think the other value as I'm sure you've talked about, and is a big thing in the online space is the massive fragmentation of audiences. Mm. Getting on Good Morning America doesn't do anything for you anymore because it's broad, right? It's getting on all these niche podcasts and finding the exact people in your avatar with the problems that you solve. And I think there's tremendous value, especially with the advent and proliferation of artificial intelligence, that we're moving away from specialization into generalization, right? One of the, one of the books that I'm obsessed with is Range by David Epstein. It talks mm. all about the science of this. And what I'm seeing, and this is completely by coincidence because this is not a strategy yet, I'm starting to get people that are finding me from totally different industries that aren't in Hollywood. And when I get them in my community, our conversations are totally different than the ones that I have with editors or composers or producers. Interesting. And they're like, I never saw things that way. It's the intersection of people's different experiences and skills and abilities that's raising the value of online education to a totally different level. So if I can speak in front of people or share strategies at a business or whatever it is from two totally different industries and ultimately bring them into the same community, it's that intersection of that interaction as well as the curation of only the information these people need with shared challenges. That's what I believe is the future of online education. Okay. Two points. The first regarding consulting, the second with the, uh, the future of online education. Uh, consulting for large businesses is one form of consulting. There are many others. For example, uh, NNG, the Nielsen Norman Group, they are a consulting uh, group. They charge $15,000 for a Zoom call. There's nothing they know that you don't. I was going to say, I, you, you've piqued my interest. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like to get the specifics. So <laughs> like, there's, there's something they're teaching that you don't. Uh, 15K, one Zoom call. And if you want it in person, it's more. Mm. If you want it customized, it's more. It's not even like custom it's a template mm-hmm. 15k per zoom call they don't care who pays the 15k it doesn't have to be a big organization it could be a smaller you, you, uh, you ever heard of this book called small giants i've heard of it i haven't read it but i've heard of it yeah sync the core concept very successful intentionally small businesses that want to do well in the world, you find people who are values aligned. We're working with them. It's going to amplify both of your missions that you have in the world. And they're willing to pay more 
quality because that's what they've built their entire business model around. And if they've already achieved some level of success, there's no way that video is not a core part of their strategy. And that's where all of your expertise mm -hmm. comes to bear to be able to have a positive impact on what it is that they're doing and to be able to talk to someone with your expertise, yeah, they pay. Because they know they already have their business metrics. They know that if they get even a 0.5% lift, whatever the number is, and they're able to keep their creative fresh because maybe they're spending on paid advertising through whatever channels and stuff like that. Oh yeah, it is a drop in the bucket to pay you for your expertise to for them to then roll that out mm -hmm. for the for q1 q2 q3 q4 because hey maybe we pay this 10k 20k 50k whatever the number is and that means that the one million dollar marketing budget doesn't go down the drain mm -hmm. yeah of course they would sign that check well we don't use checks anymore but you can do it <laughs> yeah, so boy, did you just date yourself. Your, your Gen yeah, Z audience totally, is going totally. to Wikipedia. What's a check and how do I spell it, right? A check. Uh, but it, it's interesting because uh, when I say you piqued my interest, obviously I was jo joking about the number, but there's also a lot about this that I'm very seriously interested in. I'm going to help frame why that is the case. Okay. What I wasn't interested in is I want to develop a new career as a business consultant. However, one of the things that I teach my students that is also a core part of how I design my business is diversification. Diversification of skills and interests and abilities, because I believe that everybody's story, everybody's life experiences and their past jobs, all of that has transferable skills and abilities to another realm. And the value is in the intersection. So I'll give a very quick example, and then I'm going to bring it back to this whole consultant idea, because now you've got the juices flowing. So the story that I tell when I speak about this idea of uh, diversification and intersection is that as a Hollywood film and television editor doing it over 20 years, working on shows like Cobra Kai and Empire and Burn Notice, I've reached a fairly high level of expertise. I'm not the best in the world. I haven't won Emmys. I haven't won Oscars, which, by the way, has very little to do with being the best in the world. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but I'm, I'm at a high level, like I'm in the top 1% of people that edit for a living, right? As an American Ninja Warrior... I suck. I am not a very good American Ninja Warrior. I love it. And for somebody that's my age, that's not very athletic, eh, I'm better than the average bear. Take the intersection of these two, two Venn diagrams. Mm -hmm. Name one editor with my level of expertise that's better at American Ninja Warrior than I am. <laughs> with that intersection, I'm the best in the world at something, right? Yep. So if we look at all the other skills that I teach, whether it's time management, networking, relationship building, avoiding burnout, there are a lot of people that are doing that. Like I literally just today, this is totally coincidental. I just got signed by a speakers bureau. Oh, nice. it was just, it was like an introductory get to know you call. And they, they're like, we want you to be a client. Like we just, nice. we love what you're doing and we want you to be a part of this. I'm like, that's not what I expected at all, but that's great. The point being, I went on their site looking up time management experts, burnout experts, and saw all these huge names, but none of them have the expertise in storytelling in Hollywood that I do. It's that intersection, mm -hmm. right? So if I can find companies where that intersection is incredibly valuable, where it's not just my ability to talk about the problems that they want to solve, but it's the intersection of my high-level storytelling and editing abilities, that to me is where the value is. And there's a, there's a story that you may already be aware of. This is one that I share with my students, and I can't not be in teaching and mentorship mode. This is my problem. This is why I don't bother with lead generation, because I just never shut up about teaching and mentoring. But there's a story that I tell my students all the time to help them better understand how they need to price based on their value and not based on their time. Do you know the story of Charles Steinmetz? He's an engineer for Henry Ford way back in the day. So how much of this is true versus how much of it is parable? It's a little bit in dispute, but most li it sounds like at least major parts of the story actually happen and there's documentation. But the, the paraphrased version is that there was some big giant generator that just wasn't working and it essentially sent the Ford uh, plant into a standstill. So they bring in one of the top engineers, Charles Steinmetz, who was uh, friends with Einstein and Edison. He was like part of that group, right? And essentially he said, I want you to give me a notepad, a piece of chalk, and a cot. And he sat on the cot with a notebook and he watched this generator doing whatever generators do for two days and he did nothing. And then at the end of it, he walked up to it and he put a tiny X and he said, move this coil to X, Y, or Z, whatever it was, right? And they did it and it worked. 
and he invoiced for $10,000. And they said, what is this invoice? Like, you didn't really do anything. And he said, $1 for making the X mark, 9999 for knowing where to put it. And I saw that. I'm like, that is the way that we need to price and value ourselves. What I haven't learned is how to do that for myself and for my business. And what you're talking about is a way for me to, in an hour, create that kind of value. Right now, I don't know how to do that. I don't know the audiences. I don't know the businesses. I don't even know where to start. But I know that I can, in a 60-minute Zoom conversation, generate hundreds of thousands of dollars of results. I just don't know how to find those calls and those businesses. I think that's where I'm stuck. I see. I will we'll go out of... Abstract Mona, I'll just get super concrete. Here's one idea. In-house creative teams for socially conscious businesses. Just those two together. Give me an example of what that looks like. Who would that be? So find the companies that donate to charities that you know of or care about or have any kind of interest in. Mm -hmm. Then, LinkedIn. Hey, structure of organization. Marketing. Who's the marketing department? There. Do they do video? Yeah, they do video. Oh, okay, they do video. Who are the video guys? Who's, who's, the, who's the creative team? Now we've gone from entity to human mm -hmm. that can be contacted and a conversation can be had. What are you guys doing there? You know, building of the relationship. You know, what's going on there? Oh, interesting. Have you thought about this? You know, it's actually, a, I've edited, you know, a couple of shows on Netflix. Um, you know, I have some experience with that part. And uh, I'm like, oh, oh, shit, what? 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 <laughs> say that, say that part louder. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, you've done da 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 Who are you? Why are you helping me? Like, <laughs> and, you know, well, you know, I... I saw what you guys are doing and I'm very mission and values driven. And I saw that, you know, our values aligned and I want to leave this world better than how I found it. And so I wanted to find other people who were doing that too, so that we could help each other do more of that. And if it turns into us working together, cool. If it doesn't, that's cool too, because we both walk away knowing that we left this world a better place. Boom. Now they're asking you, they're pitching you on how they can work with you. Mm -hmm. you do you do any kind of, you know, like, because like, now at this point we've connected as humans and that higher level of mission. Now we can then figure out strategy and tactics and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. And then after scope has been established, then pricing. But first, relationships, values, values alignment, always and just like that started to do just mapped out tactically how to start to find at least a few brands and then distill it down to people to then distill it down to conversations to then see to start to do a bit of what you and i have worked on together quite a bit which is audience research but high touch um something i don't know if i've ever shared this but um i used to do done for you uh research projects uh, for clients to do audience research and then there's whole system and everything for just doing what we do with surveys but like at a very very high level but with um interviews uh and creating reports and such like that but i, I don't think you would if you just had like five to ten of these conversations just that would give you a lay of the land mm -hmm. to see if there's any pattern of problems that they're facing mm -hmm. and then to see if you have a personal interest in even solving any of those problems and that becomes a really cool way to just diversify revenue streams. Uh, and it might not even be something that you do forever, but it might just be uh, something that's a little bit fun for you because at that point, you're not consulting. You're training. Mm -hmm. You're teaching. You're helping. You're serving. And they're going to be so happy and lucky to work with someone with your level of expertise to have that kind of mentorship that they were probably looking for but had no idea how to find somebody like you. Mm -hmm. And so that's a gift alone. And 
somebody that took the time to understand them as well as you did, uh, he can't pay for that. And it, they will value that. Uh, and it will be a mutually beneficial learning um, conversation. Uh, and that's just on like that angle. And then that, like I mentioned earlier, can fund, help or help fund mm -hmm. uh, everything else. Yeah, yeah. because, hey, the, 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 um, the future of online education with the curation uh, concept, 1,000%. Uh, uh, one thing that I say is, we're going from the information age to the intelligence age. Mm, I like that. It's funny it's you bring that up because everybody's calling it the age of artificial intelligence. And what I want to double down on is human intelligence. That's what I teach. I want to teach human intelligence, which, by the way, none of us are taught anyways before artificial intelligence <laughs> came along, right? Yeah. We've been, we've been taught to become widgets on the assembly line of somebody else's dreams. Right. Mm. I want to teach human intelligence so it differentiates us from the artificial intelligence. And I'm I'm intrigued about this idea of how, like you said, leveraging isn't the right word or using isn't the right word. But the path into larger audiences that you can serve can be through the companies that already serve those audiences. So yes. if we have time, I want to throw another question on top of this, which is related. It's, it's not in a different di direction. How do you take everything that you talked about and apply it instead to other people similar to me? that have much larger audiences that are already serving the same people. I don't know if that's considered B2B or B2C, but let's mm -hmm. say, for example, and I'm, I'm not uh, saying that this would be as applicable, but let's use Tim Ferriss as the example. Like Tim Ferriss is a large audience of creatives and venture capitalists, a lot of which have very, very similar challenges that I can help. There's a lot of intersection with what he talks about and what I talk about. So can you approach this in a similar fashion the way that I would with Acme Corporation versus trying to build an audience or expand an audience using somebody else's audience? Do these theories apply or is it a totally different approach? Because to me, my gut sense is from the most success that I've had finding the right people and the most engaged people is with other people's audiences where they've already cultivated those people and yeah. solved their challenges, but they can't solve the challenges that I can. Yes. There's part of the strategy that I shared earlier that is applicable. The outreach and the building of relationships and the, the finding out uh, what, who you're serving, how best to serve them, what the uh, what problems you can solve, what opportunities there are to add value, applicable. What's different is the delivery uh, mm -hmm. of the value, uh, and I'll explain for. Someone like a Tim Ferriss or uh, anyone who has cultivated uh, usually an organic audience that mm -hmm. it's very near and dear to them uh, over who knows however long. Simple conversation. Uh, and this is a rough, there's, there's all sorts of touch points and da, 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 da. I will just get down to the heart of the conversation. Hey, Tim, a lot of people email you. They ask you for help. You have books. You don't have courses. You don't have trainings. Courses and trainings provide a higher level of implementation as well as results than books do. Books start the transformational journey. Courses and training complete transformational journey. You don't have to build it. I'll, I'll, I'll run the whole thing. You just need to tell people it exists. I'll take care of the rest. And I will also make sure that it's going to absolutely provide value. There will be results. We will have reporting mechanisms in place to make sure that quality standards are X, Y, and Z. And you now, without having to do much more, can help so many more people. And yeah, there's money too. But this is about helping people. That's the basic structure of that mm. conversation. Okay, I like that, and it's, I've had that conversation with a few of the other like influencers or businesses that have built communities that are in the filmmaking space. Um, I'll give, just kind of give you a quick example, just if it's helpful for the audience or just for you to understand the mm -hmm. context. Um, it goes back to one of my challenges of there are so many different things that I'm interested in, different course materials, different problems to solve, but the one that almost everybody gravitates towards is my ability to build genuine relationships and help creative introverts network 
sniper like approach and land their that's, dream job. That's kind of that's been the if we're talking about the 80 20, that's what's generating 80 percent of the revenue through 20 percent of my efforts. Right. So I, there are a few uh, skills based businesses in the editorial and the filmmaking space where they teach the hard skills. We teach editing or we teach lighting or cinematography, but they suck at teaching the business and they suck at teaching networking. And they're like, what if you just taught networking to my audience? We're, we've mm-hmm. tried building networking courses. We're not very good at it. There's some basic superficial stuff. I haven't met anybody that understands networking for the creative mind better than you do. Can we just put your product in our course library? That's an example. I'm at the early stages of some of those conversations. It sounds like it's a similar model to what you're talking about. Similar on the, so, you know, I I did a video not too long ago about the new nine-step client roadmap that we're using to be able to serve all clients through 2024 on that roadmap. I break those nine steps down into three different parts, audience, offer, sales. The audience part that you just shared is the same. Mm -hmm. The offer is different. Mm. In what you just described, uh, with the course living on their platform, it's a little bit different. Um, depending, it, it, it all depends on. Uh, generally, the more responsibility you take is the more you will be paid, mm. basically. Uh, and part of that can also include the hosting of the course. And, and it... It being a referral to Zach and edification of the Optimize Yourself brand Mm -hmm. uh, at a higher level, which then amplifies your brand, uh, not just with them, but for all future partnerships that you might also do as well. Mm. The more public that is, is the more of your marketing that's already done because someone can validate by themselves, oh, we go to his site and, oh, look, he's got this big thing with big name person here. Oh, he's a big deal. We should work with him. And sales cycle like that just cut in half. Mm -hmm. They've already pre-committed to working with you. It's just now logistics Um, versus if the program course and it's not to say that this isn't a viable model uh it's just like there are different advantages and disadvantages Mm -hmm. uh if it's behind like their paywall where nobody can see it right yeah yeah so that's 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 one of the nuts that i'm trying to crack right now is what does that funnel look like i think for if we kind of go back half a step to what you're talking about even with a consulting model Mm-hmm. Um, I was looking, I, I think of everything in systems and workflows. Like I'm literally, you and I are very similar in that my entire life is just an endless series of flow charts and whimsical, right? Yes. So I'm putting all the boxes together. And if we're looking at like the first major phase, one of the areas I'm stuck is what are all the various criteria that I use to search so I can find the companies that have the audiences that I need where I can serve their challenges. Once I have the criteria down, the outreach and relationship building process that's what I excel at. So that's the second part, right? So if it's finding the right criteria and being ready to reach out, I'm really good at that with my existing audience and I understand the criteria, but I'm stuck in the exact same place that most of my students are, which is I don't even know who I'm supposed to be reaching out to. So in this new space, I don't know what are the search criteria, what are the pull down menus, but once it's like, here's the list of the five people that need to be my new best friends, boom, this is where I'm best. Now I get them on the Zoom call and they say, what do you have to offer us and how much? Phase three is again where I'm like, I have no idea how to structure this. Like, I understand how to work with individuals. I now understand what they're willing to pay as far as private coaching versus small group live cohort co- coaching versus monthly subscriptions. Like, I've learned a lot about pricing psychology, a lot of which, shameless plug through you. Um, but I feel very confident what I think people that are my audience will pay for individually. I have no clue how to structure an offer if a company is interested in my services. So it's like phase one, don't know the criteria. Phase two, building the relationship. It's what I do best. Phase three, packaging the offer and selling it. That's also where there are, there's a lot of things that I don't know that I don't know. But I can see how I can apply it both to B2B and still B2C. For me, it's just connecting the dots and filling the gaps. I have a framework called ideas. Ideate 
discover, experiment, accelerate, scale. What we just had was an ideation conversation. We ideated on the audience, the offer, and the sales process. The next level up of validating any part of the audience offer or sales or the entire thing, discovery. Discover what a few people say. Mm -hmm. Experiment. Discover what a few, it will be experiment and you test and see what a few people do. Mm -hmm. Accelerate, see what more people do, and then scale, see what a lot of people do. The discovery stage is the conversations. You got to be able to find and create this list of people. Two tactical resources to be able to help you get started on that. Dream 100 list. Russell Brunson, Expert Secrets book. Mm -hmm. Read that chapter on creating your dream 100. Second resource, Spark Torah. Go through that exercise, Russell Brunson, Expert Secrets. That's going to get you started. And then now, Spark Torah is going to give you um, be the starting point for being able to develop what some of the criteria is. And then once you go through Spark Torah, the next place to go from there is LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the other really, really powerful thing that I found as well is like if you combine uh, the Dream 100, the output from the Dream 100 with what you found from Spark Torah, writing down your insights, here's the supercharger way. Uh, I tested it. It's really, it's, it's really wild. Uh, now you throw all of that output and you create a prompt in chat GPT. Mm -hmm. Then you say, Hey, chat GPT, I want to be able to find these people on LinkedIn. Here are all of the advanced search filters that LinkedIn Sales Navigator has. Build me the search criteria that you would use to be able to find those people. Mm. And now, you're, for the first pass of developing your search criteria, and you got ChatGPT AI assistance creating that. Now you plug it into LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Now you look at what LinkedIn Sales Navigator brings back. Is it a viable list? Now you do a little bit of manual qualification to then check and see, did it bring back brands that you would potentially work with in that earlier part of the conversation where we spoke about hmm, how do we values alignment and then capabilities, those two, and then just having seen the size of the organization, number of full-time employees, you can use that as a proxy to be able to reverse engineer some kind of revenue range for the business. And that gives you a bit of being able to size, oh, is this small business enterprise, you know, and then there's even more advanced stuff that you could do with like, huh, okay, well, how profitable might they be with that kind of employee count with this kind of product? It's all sorts of stuff, but mm -hmm. a little bit advanced, but the key thing is for you to be able to then plug that stuff into sales nav navigate, see if there's values alignment, see if there's capabilities alignment. Now you have your list. Right. Yeah. I love it. Nerd cool. nerd. Man, I love I, I love nerding out on all the the connection and the the networking stuff. Um, and what one of the things that I've uh, that this is just this is a little bit more overarching and less tactical, but I'm and I'm kind of sharing this more for anybody that's listening, is that as an entrepreneur, you hit these points where like things are going well, and then all of a sudden you hit a wall and you're struggling, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what Scott Belsky calls the messy middle, and I'm in a really really messy middle right now. And because of the strikes and be, like the you know significant dip in revenue, I've uh, been very very challenging. But one of the things or two things that I've looked at that are really heartening for the future are all of the untapped resources that I have. One of which, as you and I discussed, uh, I don't know how much you talk about revenue numbers, but I'm comfortable sharing uh, that with a list of still to this day less than five thousand people, I've generated one point one million dollars in revenue, which again is because I focus on getting people results, not lead generation. But the other thing that I haven't even tapped into yet is LinkedIn. The reason being creative industries, specifically Hollywood, up until now, they have ignored LinkedIn because LinkedIn is for the suits, quote unquote, right? Mm -hmm. But now everybody's migrating away from Facebook and Instagram and they're going to LinkedIn. Yeah. And I've, I haven't even scratched the surface of what I can do with LinkedIn. So I'm really, really excited about the possibilities of using LinkedIn as both a channel just to share content. It's something we're, we're building the machine to do that now, but using it as a way to connect with the right people. So 
I've I've hit a place where again I'm in this messy middle, but there are so many untapped resources that tell me once I can just expand to either reaching the the right people with the right audiences or growing the email list, like the there there's so much more that can be done with this beyond what I've already done. So I'm I'm sharing that more because it's been a really, really tough year for me and there's been a lot of doubts. And I know that there are a lot of other entrepreneurs that feel a lot of those doubts. And I'm focusing on all the things that are still available to me that I haven't even tapped into rather than all the shit that's been going wrong this year. Because boy, did I pick the wrong year to teach Hollywood creatives how to advance their dream careers. Oh, talk about bad timing. Kind of like trying to teach in-person networking to people during a pandemic, <laughs> right? I'll say one thing to almost link this back to a previous episode, actually the Jay Abraham episode. We didn't talk about this specifically on that episode, but in preparing for that episode, you know, I had to read the book. Uh, and in the book, one of the reasons uh, that there's this concept of epic exits, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it's about finding opportunity in crisis mm. and ethically uh, helping people exit businesses that they don't want to be a part of anymore. But what's the fascinating mindset shift uh, inside of that book for me was for every entrepreneur that's thinking about stopping their business, there's another entrepreneur that is ready to buy it because they know how to flip it around. Mm -hmm. And so the gap between those two is information. Yeah. That information. It. Yeah. Well, um, that... you go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say there is so much more. Um, I would love to keep talking to you about, uh, but I wanted to flip it back to you. Is there anything else that you want to share? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the first thing, uh, that I think is really important that I've learned this year, I've, I've basically, um, I've learned how to master horribly difficult, painful failures and situations and like turning them into my advantage. Um, which is one of the reasons that I am constantly trying to find new things that I can fail at as quickly as possible. Cause it's the fastest way to grow. Um, but it's funny because the first thing that I thought of when you were talking about how there's one entrepreneur that's ready to get out of their business and there's another one ready to acquire it, what I've learned through the adversity both in 2020 but now much more acutely this year is how, how dead center it is that I found what I love doing. So it never once has there been doubt of, oh, maybe this was dumb or I shouldn't have started a business or I don't know, maybe there's somebody out there that I could find that wants to buy it and pay me some money. Like I, I'm so excited about continuing to build it and solve these problems. And I yeah. needed the adversity to realize this is what I should be doing. Cause there's always doubts. Like I've turned down many lucrative, high profile Hollywood projects because I'm like, nah, I don't want to work in that. I'd rather, you know, be figuring out my coaching program or whatever. Like mm -hmm. that's what I really enjoy. So I've turned down a lot of money in my career to pursue things that I really believe in. But when it gets to the point where you're like, uh, I'm dipping into my emergency funds because the business isn't going so well, it's really easy to give up on it. But I needed the adversity to have the confidence that I'm doing the right thing. So anybody that's stuck right now, just think is the intuition, I'm on to something and I just need to keep pushing versus my gut instinct is maybe this is a signal for me to, to give up or not even just give up, but a signal that this isn't the right thing and it's okay to quit and move on and go after the next thing. Or like you said, find somebody that might acquire it. Um, but the thought of somebody acquiring what I'm doing, like that is not even remotely in my mindset right now. It is how do I get through the trenches and get to the other side? And I'm excited about getting through the trenches and getting to the other side. But I'm I'm ready to not be in the trenches anymore. I'm I'm ready I'm ready to get to the other side. I've had enough of the trenches for a while. I I feel that and yeah, it's time, you know, and what I took away from everything you just shared is that um, adversity is the mental weight in the gym of life. Mm -hmm. Only yep. we have to use it to be able to become stronger. Yep. yep. And that's that's why I choose the obstacles in my life so that when obstacles choose me, I am ready for them. Nice. I love that. That's excellent. Where can everyone find out more about you? Yeah. Simplest place to go is just go to the website, optimizeyourself.me.me. I've got a bunch of uh, different guides and, you know, different resources, and I'm very, very approachable. They can send a message via the contact form. Um, I would say that if they want to build a much deeper relationship, the best place to go is the Optimize Yourself podcast. 
Um, that's essentially my number one lead generation tool just by default. I see it as product creation. To me, that's creating content, but that's what's generated the vast majority of my leads and what I build my business around. Um, but if you want to listen to me drone on and on and on in hundreds of episodes and getting on a countless number of soapboxes, I'm happy to have them go find my Optimize Yourself podcast. I love it. The product is the marketing. The marketing is the product. That's the idea. <laughs> uh, thank you again for this. This was my pleasure. Uh, and I'll be looking forward to another one. At some yeah, point. absolutely. And thank you. I'm, uh, I'm doing what I'm doing largely because you've helped me get through trenches in the past. So uh, I appreciate all that you've done and gotten me to this point and hopefully much further and beyond. My honor. Hey, thanks for checking out the show. If you liked it, go ahead and hit the like button and also subscribe so you don't miss another one. It also tells us which ones that you like the most so that we can then do more interviews like that. If you want to go from idea to implementation, though, especially if you're wanting to productize your expertise so that you can scale your impact on your clients and, of course, grow your business, then join our email list. There we're going to talk about how modern consultants can productize their expertise so that they can have a greater impact on the world around them and live life on their terms. If that's up your alley, I hope to see you on the other side. Talk soon.